Good morning and namaskar. Welcome to the India podcast on Bharat Varsha and its stories. The defense of Hindu society by Sita Ram Goyal. Chapter 1 The situation at present. In an earlier series, Hindu society and the seas, I had dealt with the forces which threaten Hindu society and are striving to throttle it out of existence with aid and abetment from their international allies. I undertook at that time to write another series regarding the steps which Hindu society should take in order to break out of the seas and snatch the initiative from its sworn enemies. I have delayed this second series deliberately. First I wanted to watch and weigh the reaction from the readers of the first series. Secondly, the more I thought over the subject, the more diffident I grew about my own competence to deal with it adequately. The response from the readers had been positive. I have received many letters of appreciation from Hindu residing in all parts of the countries as well as abroad and belonging to all sections of society and age groups. Most of them have congratulated me for an articulating in terms clear and concrete what they themselves have felt instinctively for a long period of time a few scholars and journalists who have never been known for their sympathy for hinduism or hindu causes have however remarked caustically that i have failed to frighten them some other birds of the same feather have dived deeper and referred to my mentality rather than refute my facts or demolish my logic It was far from my intention to frighten anyone far less the hindu society that i aspire to serve but our hand to mouth scholars and journalists have only a number of shibale up their sleeves if one says that some events and trends are pregnant with bright possibilities they dismiss him as a dreamer on the other hand if one draws attention to dangers that are maturing they attack him as an alarmist What they always refuse to do is to join a serious debate on any subject and yet they strut around with superior airs as if they know all the answers. Most of the time their superior airs hide only in stark ignorance, mental sloth and moral indifference. I will not therefore enter into an argument with this tribe. My diffidence. My diffidence however is an altogether different matter. Defense of a living and complex entity like a society is no easy task. It needs a sure touch which has to be sympathetic at the same time. A defense which does not take into account the spiritual, moral and cultural aspirations embodied in and expressed by a society can endanger rather than energize it. This diffidence is doubly warranted in the cases of vast and variegated societies such as the Hindu society. and a like of which has been seen only rarely in human history at least not on this scale it is perhaps presumptuous on my part to deal with a subject which can only be handled adequately and wholesomely by sages seers saints and visionaries at the end of this exercise i may only prove the old adage that fools rush in where angels fear to tread hindu society has grown and shaped itself in the vision of vyas and valmiki Manu and Yagnavalka, Narad and Vashishtha and a hundred other exponents of Sanatan Dharma in all its dimensions and dynamics. Hindu society has been inspired through the ages by such mighty shastras as the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gita, the Jainagma, the Tripitaka, the various Yoga Shastra, the Vani of Siddhas and Sant and the devotional outpourings of Alvars and Nayanas. Hindu society has been defended during its days of distress by such high-souled heroes as Chandragupta, Skandagupta, Vikramaditya, Yashodharman, Bappa Rawal, Jaipal, Bhojdev, Prithviraj, Pratap Rudra, Veer Pandya, Harihara and Rana Sangha. Hindu society has fought a long drawn out struggle for freedom against Islamic invaders under the leadership of such veterans as Maharana Pratap, Shivaji, Maharaja Surajmal, Banda Bairagi, Lokmanya Tilak, Veer Savarkar, Mahatma Gandhi and Sardar Patel. Hindu society has been reawakened and reformed by such visionaries as Bankim Chandra, Maharshi Dayanand, 
स्वामी विवेकानंद श्री और रविंद्रनाथ एंड सुब्रमण्यम भारती इट इज स्मॉल वंडर देर फॉर दैट आई फील लाइक एन इंट्रूडर इन दिस ऑगस्ट फील्ड नो वन इज मोर अवेयर देन माई सेल्फ ऑफ द लिमिटेश ऑफ हेड एंड हार्ट फ्रॉम विच आई सफर Adapting a metaphor from Kalidas I can state my case in the following shlok Kwa dharma prabhavah tantra kwa cha alp visamati titir suh dustaram mohad udupen asmi sagaram which translates into I am a small mind when it comes to understanding the social system which has been shaped by dharma It is only in a fit of folly that I am attempting to cross the great ocean by means of ram shackle raft. But my heart bleeds. But my heart bleeds when I see this great society being attacked by sheer barbarians whose only weapon is either a criminal theology masquerading as religion or a materialistic dogma sustained by the lowest in human nature or a phony modernism parroting the latest slogans from the west. My mind is deeply disturbed when I witness the leaders of this great society going on the defensive in the face of wanton aggression from inhuman ideologies whose only stock in trade is self-righteous spite. I fail to understand the selective journalism which spotlights only the atrocities on Harijans when statistics go to show that caste Hindus provide many more victims to violence in our countryside. which plays up only stories of bright burning without caring to find out what is happening to our old parents in many modern homes under the spell of an imported culture which places a premium on what it's described as youth which accuses hindu organizations of aggression in every communal strife without investigating the hard facts about the provocation from the so-called minorities and which in short replaces serious debates on every subject with a few mindless clichés reactionary and progressive right and left capitalist and socialist revivalist and modern communal and secular and so on openness of the hindu society history stands witness that hindu society has never refused to listen to those of its critics who have had the good of this society at heart This society has always accepted very well-intentioned advice and tried its best to reform and renew itself. This society has always hanged its head in shame before every well-deserved reprimand and done a penance in good time, provided the reprimand has come from those whose credentials are not in doubt. Hindu society has never been a closed society which catches cold at the first whiff of a wind from outside. It has never been a fundamentalist fraternity parroting the pontifications of a self-appointed prophets or burning the entire incense of its reverence at the altar of ridiculous revelations or ruling out every rational and reflective discussion of its dogmas. It has never been a regimented flock groveling in an orgy of sinfulness which can be washed only by the blood of God's only begotten son and waiting helplessly for fiats from the God's vice regent on earth. On the contrary Hindu society has been the meeting point as well as the melting point of as many spiritual visions as the human psyche is capable of springing up simultaneously It has been a willing and welcoming platform for as many seers sages saints and mystics as have responded to the deepest stirrings in the human soul It has been a repository of as many metaphysical points of view as human reasons can render in human language and it has been a vast laboratory for as many cultural social economic and political experiments as human nature in its widest sense can carry out and cope with a painful sight it is therefore a painful sight that the spokesmen of some puny petrified ideology should be pointing accusing fingers at hindu society and that this society should fail to muster sufficient self confidence to repel the attack Hindu society never tries to tick them off in good time with a stem warning they fully deserve. It has never asked them, "Who the hell are you?" It has never told them, "Go and get lost," or better still, "Do a bit of introspection." You are blind with beams in both your eyes, and yet you have the cheek to raise a hue and cry about a mere mote in one of mine. Here is some good advice for you. 
Stop telling lies about me, lest I will be forced to tell the truth about you. What is worse? A brood of professional Hindu beta has tried and tested an armory of cheap jibes, polytheism, pantheism, idolatry, brahmanism, obscurantism, revivalism, fundamentalism, communalism, and the rest, and discovered to its great glee that the jibes hurt. It is a sorry spectacle indeed that this society should take jibes as well-deserved reproaches for its own good and indulge in an orgy of beast beating at the behest of every Hindu beta. The sworn enemy of Hindu society has made a great game out of some scare words in order to keep Hindu society on the defensive and go on drawing apology after apology from the spokesmen of this Hindu society day in and day out. The Brood of Hindu Betas Here we have the inheritors of some brood-soaked bigotries holding aloft the flag of monotheism and denouncing Hindu ways of worship as polytheism and idolatry. Hindu society has yet to scan the scriptures of these criminal creeds and have a close look at their prophets, saviors and saints. The day Hindu society does that, these creeds will beat a hasty retreat and know not how to defend their dark doctrines and horrid heroes. Here we have the erstwhile traffickers in slave trade trumpeting about human brotherhood and social equality and brushing aside the whole of Hindu society as a beehive of Brahmin domination, caste discrimination, degradation of women, bonded child labour and what not. Hindu society has yet to revive the matrix of its societies and expose the true character of human brotherhood and social equality from the annals of their remote as well as recent history. The day Hindu society does that, the human brotherhood will give up its bark and the social equality shed its self-righteousness. Here we have the salesmen of a proletarian revolution denouncing Hindu society as primitive, feudal, semi-colonial, capitalist and full of class oppression in all stages and forms. Hindu society has yet to peep into their proletarian paradise and raise the curtains of a vast salve empire sustained by mass slaughter and ceaseless terror. The day Hindu society does that, the socialist swearology will lose its sting and know not how to hide the horrible scenes. Here we have the minions of mercenary culture dishing out lectures on individual freedom, rule of law, parliamentary democracy, secular state, human rights, rate of growth, distribution of prosperity, abolition of poverty, and arrest of population explosion. This imported culture frowns at the fundamental failures of the Hindu social system and hurdles on the path of progress presented by the Hindu cultural milieu. They advocate rapid modernization of Hindu society in the name of this or that Western model. Hindu society has yet to expose this pompous priest calf patronized by foreign fundamentalists, multinationals, secret services and defense departments of the West and place on public view what is hidden behind the pretentious verbiage. The day Hindu society does that, it will show that their notion of individual freedom does not function beyond a small class of English-educated fraternity, that their rule of law provides justice only to those who can pay the price, that the parliamentary democracy is a game of multiplying grievances in the minds of people who are then manipulated by the self-seeking politicians in a ruthless pursuit of power, that their secular state is a promoter of separatism amongst the so-called minorities, some of which have been artificially carved out of Hindu society itself, that their human rights means the right of plain criminals to terrorize innocent citizens, that their rate of growth refers idly to the growth of their own bank balances besides what they themselves bemoan as black money. That their distribution of prosperity means distribution of the better and bigger jobs amongst themselves. That their abolition of poverty means sweeping the mass destitution under the carpet of doctored statistics. And their arrest of population explosion works out towards reducing the Hindus in a minority in their own Hindu homeland. As regards their Western models, all of them are sick with rising curves of crime and boredom bred by excess of hedonism. And what pollutions at all levels, physical, psychological, psychic and spiritual, produced by hyper-industrialism and soulless commercialism. Here, 
we have some two-faced secularists who try to impress Western audiences by talking glibly about Indian yoga and mysticism, Indian school of philosophy, Indian panorama of sciences, Indian styles of music and dance, Indian languages and literature, and the Indian genius for unity and diversity, but who go on into an uncontrollable tantrum if somebody tells them that what they are talking or taking pride in is the Hindu cultural heritage and describes India as the Hindu homeland. The same secularists not only do not object but also approve and applaud when some of its cultural heritage is credited to Islam. And when visiting VIPs from Islamic countries refer to India as the second largest Muslim country. These are the people who have fashioned India's foreign policy in a manner which makes India look like a leader of an aggressive Islamic bloc rather than a peaceful nation pledged to a non-alignment and friendship for all. Hindu society has yet to affirm that all this spiritual, cultural, philosophical and scientific heritage is Hindu. That no one who is ashamed of being named a Hindu has a right to take pride in it. Hindu society has yet to proclaim that India has always been and will always remain a Hindu homeland and that people who fail to come to terms with Hindu society and culture have no place in this country. Hindu society has yet to point out that only contribution of Islam has been ruination of this country in medieval times and partition with widespread bloodshed in the recent period and that projection of pan-Islamism in India's foreign policy is neither sanctioned nor supported by the Hindu masses who have no illusion about Islam or Islamic culture or Islamic causes or Islamic countries. The Failures of Hindu Society Hindu society has so far failed on all these fronts because it has failed to see the closed creeds and criminal ideologies for what they are. It has been suffering from self-forgetfulness and has taken in by the self-righteous slogans raised by these creeds and ideologies. It has tried to ransack its own records in search of matching prescriptions. In the process, Hindu society has been yielding ground to wanton aggression all along the line. Christianity and Islam have only to raise the slogans of monotheism as opposed and supposedly superior to polytheism, and Hindu thinkers go out in search of a similar monotheism in Hindu shastras. At the same time, Hindu scholars line up quotations from the same shastras which are seemingly denunciatory of polytheism and image worship. The thinkers and the scholars seldom stop to see that the monotheistic creeds are creations of the outer and lower levels of human mind, and that nothing which is prescribed by the criminal theologies can have a place in the Shastras or Sanatan Dharma, which have their source in the highest reaches of human soul. So also in the case of Christian claim of social service, the Islamic claim of human brotherhood and the communist claim of social equality or the modernist claim of democracy and secularism etc. Human scholars keep busy marshalling quotations from their own shastras and suppose similar ideas and citing examples of Hindu history of those who put such ideas into practice, the wealth of Hindu spirituality, philosophy and culture, history and society thus goes into getting weighed in balance which is tilted against it from the very start. It is small wonder that the entire Hindu heritage is found wanting in the final assessment. The First Principle of Defense The first principle of defense which Hindu society has to observe while preparing its defense is that it will stop processing and evaluating its own heritage in terms of ideas and ideals projected by close creeds and pretentious ideologies. On the contrary, Hindu society will henceforward progress and process and evaluate the heritage of these creeds and ideologies in terms of its own categories of thoughts and find out the real worth of Christian Islamic communist and modernist claims. The first need of the other, therefore, is for humans to become aware of the fundamentals of their own faith, Hindu spirituality. The premise on which their own society has evolved Hindu sociology and the vicissitudes which this society has experienced in the march of time Hindu history. These are the three domains in which the Hindu image has been distorted to the utmost by imperialist thought systems resulting in deep sense of inferiority from which Hindus suffer at present. 
Hindus have become devoid of self-confidence simply because they have ceased to take legitimate, well-informed and conscious pride in their spiritual, cultural and social heritage. This lack of pride has led to serious weakening of Hindu psyche. Hindus are no more prepared to stand up and fight for anything because they are no more believe or feel that anything is worth fighting for, nor at least to the bitter end. The sworn enemies of Hindu society have taken advantage of this enervation of Hindus. They feel instinctively that threats coupled with some show of violence are sure to frighten the Hindus out of their wits and make them yield almost anything including precious parts of their own homeland. This was the end of chapter 1. Stay tuned.